And so this is uh, as we expect. So the indicators that we are calculating are in fact capturing resiliency. We start. We decided to start with consistency actually because it's uh, just a, a measure of the variation across the lactation curve because we haven't actually identified the perturbations yet. But we do expect that consistency is a, is a trait that's linked with resilience uh, moving forward as we start to dig deeper into uh, perturbations. Hello and welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. It's a pleasure today to have with us Fiona Guinan from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, we took a few minutes uh, before this podcast to catch up and, and uh, get to know uh, Fiona a bit more and, and her background and her work. And uh, she's doing some really interesting, exciting work in the area of, of linking uh, really the, uh, the health and production data of cows to their re- resiliency. So, uh, you know, how uh, able is a cow to bounce back from some stress, whether that be a disease event or, or a management stressor. Uh, the mixer wagon was broken today and cows were out of feed. The parlor was down for an hour. The, the routine got messed up. So, Fiona, welcome and uh, get started. If you can give a little background about uh, where you're from and, and, and how you got to Wisconsin, and then we'll dig into your research. Sure. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction and the opportunity to be here to talk with you today. So, as you mentioned, my name is Fiona Guinan. I'm from Ireland. I did my undergraduate degree in at University College Dublin in agricultural science. While I was there, I took uh, animal breeding and genetics modules, and my professor was Dr. Alan Fahey. He actually did his postgraduate studies in the U.S., and he was always encouraging us to uh, pursue international opportunities. And so when I graduated, I actually came out to uh, Maryland and I did an internship with the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, who are responsible for carrying out the genetic evaluations of dairy cattle in the U.S. And I worked with uh, management data, all the production records from the DHI system in the National Cooperator Database. From there, I went to the University of Georgia and I did a master's degree in animal genetics. And my advisor there was Dr. Daniela Lorenzo. I worked on changes in genetic trends since the incorporation of genomic information into the evaluation system and also changes in herd statistics over time. So then in 2022, in January, I came to the University of Wisconsin-Madison on a PhD fellowship funded by CDCB and the National DHIA, the National Dairy Herd Information Association. And uh, my advisors here are Dr. Kent Weigel and Dr. Francisco Penigari-Cano. As Mark mentioned, I'm working on resilience indicators, and we are using a very interesting, a very novel data set from dairy records management systems, where we have daily milk weights for about 500,000 cows in 30 states in 300 herds across the US. And uh, yeah, looking forward to talking with you today about the project and uh, getting into the discussion. That's really exciting, and and it's certainly a really robust um, data set. Um, I guess to start, Within that, um, so you have this huge data set, lots of cows, lots of data. What are some of the ways uh, that you're, you know, slicing that that data, so to speak, in terms of herd size, breed, uh, other parameters, geographic regions, and so forth? Because obviously, you may suspect that uh, the cow in, in a real heat stress environment may not be, for certain stressors, as resilient as a, as a cow not under heat stress or, or other factors. Yeah, that, that's that's a great question, a great place to start. So when we started to get this data moving, I mean, I guess the first place you have to start is where to store data and how to store data. I mean, that's some of the interesting points with novel sensors, right? We have to think about quality control, especially when we're working with these uh, new data sources. And so what we decided first of all to do was the majority of the data, which is very representative of the US, is hold the Holstein breed. Although we do have uh, all of the breeds represented, but you know, 90% of the records or the daily milk weights are from the Holstein breed. As well as that, we have uh, 10% of the herds are from robotic milking systems. We decided to uh, just limit it to conventional parlors with the inline milk meters to start with. Uh, as well as that, uh, that's also very relevant in terms of heat stress. So we do have 
uh, records in states from, we have 30 states represented, and they are from different geographical regions with different climates. So as we move forward, uh, we will be, we're talking about incorporating some weather data into the predictions as well, because that's definitely uh, an important challenge for dairy cattle. How we do that, uh, I'm not sure yet. We have to figure that out, but it is definitely a consideration we have because, you know, cows in Wisconsin are going to have cold stress, whereas cows in Georgia or Florida are going to have heat stress. And so there are some cool technologies where you can look at uh, the weather within a two and a half squared kilometer to um, model that within our uh, predictions. But as of right now, we haven't included that um, for our current resilience indicators. But as we move forward, that is something we can definitely include. Okay. Will there be any nutritional type data in terms of uh, you know, outside of the data that's replicated on a routine basis? Is there any herd survey, so to speak, so you can uh, have some more information or is that really outside of the scope? For this specific project, it's outside of the scope, but uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Lisa Cavani, is working um, with the UW herd on the resili- on resilience indicators using dry matter intake, so the data that was collected for the feed efficiency trials. Uh, she's looking at uh, perturbations uh, based on dry matter intake. So that would be a separate project, but under the same umbrella of resilience uh, within our group. Okay, excellent. You're, you're into this project now, you're working on your PhD. I guess take this fast forward now, uh, hopefully sooner than later, but we know these projects take quite a bit of time, especially the, the data management and so forth. And what is the the end goal of this for the, for the producer of the industry? So what will this data, uh, this project then, then result in for the future? Sure. That's a great question. What's the the point, right? That's a big question when we do research always. And for me personally, I really enjoy working on projects where the producer uh, ultimately benefits and directly benefits. And when when you think of uh, being a business owner, that has to be an economic benefit, right? Because that's how we make decisions. And so when we think about resilience, um, the, the economic benefit is... So let's say we have two cows. One is a relatively high producing cow and one maybe is a bit lower. So let's say 100 pounds a day versus 80 pounds a day. Well, if this 100 pounds a day cow is uh, on average producing 100 pounds a day, but actually has a high variation and some of that milk actually doesn't make it to the tank because of, you know, antibiotic treatments and so on. Well, what, how much of that milk are you actually being paid for? So you can have an average uh, amount of milk, but that can vary in how much actually makes it to the tank. Also with that, there's a labor uh, cost associated with it. So a cow that fluctuates more, you have to move her more to the sick pen, you know, requires more uh, one-on-one time, we'll say, and also more um, employees for that, changing pens and so on and mon- monitoring. Whereas if we have a cow that's just trucking along all the time, you know, never needs any um, attention as such and always consistently hits a target that we expect, uh, you know, the ideal cow in this situation is the cow that you don't even know her tag because you have never, never have any problems with her. So from a management perspective, I think that's very appealing for producers, you know, and also from an economic perspective, I think uh, if we incorporate these predictions and extracting value from data that's, there that's sitting there you know that we're not currently doing anything with in terms of genetic selection is also a very exciting project to work on and i think the benefits are uh, very tangible for that fiona have you thought about as, as i think about this and and uh what you're doing uh and maybe not being too anthropomorphic here but you know what portion of resiliency would be genetic or potentially be genetic versus about management, and I'll say even management from birth as a calf, right? You know, the um, University of British Columbia obviously has done, is doing a lot of research in terms of so behavior and management of you know, those young animals from uh, an age where they're more accustomed to, to humans and, uh, you know, re- reducing uh, stress, stressful events. I guess I'm just thinking, and we probably don't know, but yeah, it, it's, it's, 
So again, I'll be, I'm being more anthropomorphic. But what is maybe different in, in the management of animals, how they're raised or their interaction with humans or that tributes to the resiliency? So I'll start talking about the genetic side of it because that's that was when I started this project, that was the goal to calculate heritabilities and genetic correlations and so on. And so the work that has been done is from the Netherlands, uh, Poppy. They did, uh, they used data from all robotic herds in the Netherlands since 1998. And they used different methods to uh, calculate a predicted curve. So they found heritabilities um, between 0.20 and uh, 0.24, so about 24% heritability, which is quite high for um, resilience indicators. As well as that, similar results have been found in poultry production, where they do uh, daily egg production and also in uh, pigs, where they look at the feed intake and the body weight over time. And so it seems to be a heritable trait. We found heritabilities uh, using LOS to model lactation curves of 0.23, so 23%. And as well as that, the genetic correlations with livability traits have been uh, desirable where less consistent cows have a lower uh, PTAs, predicted transmitting abilities for productive life and livability in the herd. So all of these studies are done using daily milk weights or some sort of a measurement that's later in life. So you're going back to your question on calves. I mean, obviously, I think it has an impact uh, on resilience later on in life. I don't know how we can connect all of that right now. Um, we, we have a ton of data in uh, our data set, and I, I understand that, you know, based on sensors on calves, automatic feeders, there would be similar data. And uh, I think down the road, we will eventually connect all of this. And I think it's super exciting to be uh, a part of that. But right now, uh, I don't know of any research that connects the two, but I would expect that there is a strong correlation between the two um, indicators at, you know, early life. And then once you get into lactation. Yeah. Again, I, in so many of these, uh, podcast interviews, discussions, if you will, you know, we get back to the future with, with sensor data and more technology, what we're going to be able to really understand further and then, uh, capture the benefits of these technologies to be able to actually buy them. So, so that's super exciting. Um, <clears throat> Another question for you is, you know, we know well that capture diagnosis and the capture of health data on many farms is quite variable. We have, you know, herds that do more intensive, if you will, fresh cow checks. They maybe are using sensor data, uh, milk weights and so forth to, to go out and find those cows. Um, other herds are a little bit more of a hands-off approach and, and, you know, looking for more of a deviation or, or just observations. Um, as you're looking forward in your data sets to rank resiliency and then, and health events, um, can you describe a little bit how you're, uh, normalizing some of that data or classifying health events? You know, what, what is a ketosis? What is hematritis, uh, on each individual farm? For sure. So I mentioned we received the data from DRMS and so what we decided to do was we originally did have the raw data. But uh, again, standardization is a big challenge in our industry that I think everybody is impacted by. And so what we decided to do was following the, uh, the definitions by the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding, we asked for the data in that format. So if we do, uh, which is ultimately the end goal of this research, end up providing genetic evaluations for resilience indicators or you know, incorporating them into selection indexes, the indicators that we have calculated will be based on the exact same definitions that are currently uh, used uh, in the industry for health PTAs. Now, uh, we do have some additional data, which is the sick pen data and the vet check data, which I haven't worked with before, but we have it uh, flown into our database. And when it comes to the data in there, obviously we will have some uh, work to do standardizing that data. And we uh, have thought about this. I haven't got exactly into uh, connecting health records with the perturbations or the dev deviations in milk production. But once we do um, 
get into that topic, uh, I think we're going to lose some herds, right? Because once we do the standardization, we won't have as much herds as we uh, do because we're going to have strict quality control uh, measures for the health records. So I think, yeah, there's going to be obviously differences among her across herds on that. And uh, it's going to take us some time to do quality control on those records for sure. Yeah, that's something that we within our group have spent a lot of time of working with, especially when we have a new client in terms of uh, correct diagnosis, disease definition and classification. Um, because obviously, as you know, we uh, perhaps a calf is, that is breathing heavy is in pneumonia when it isn't or other, you know, ain't doing right um, syndromes in adult cows, uh, which maybe gets falsely classified. So it sounds like you have a rigorous method for standardization of that and, and therefore will at least be able to capture significant diseases, mastitis, uh, ketosis, and so forth. Yeah, and I think um, one of the nice things is that we have a unique pen information of each individual daily milk weight. And recently, uh, I presented my preliminary findings at the National Dairy Herd Information Association meeting in Sacramento. And there were a lot of producers in the audience, so I decided to do uh, an informal survey just to get uh, an idea of the number of producers and how they are the number of producers that record pens and how they record pens and it was uh, great to see that you know over half recorded sick pen information and then you know fresh pen information and breeding pens and things like that so we are we we're getting closer each step and i think um you know, having direct access to producers is very valuable as well. And having those conversations about, you know, how they could use uh, resilience indicators moving for- forward helps us with that. And, and Fiona, um, so what are some of the findings? And that, that's that's even more exciting, your work on this project. What were some of the findings that you uh, presented or even since then have, have found that you can report on? <laughs> sure. So... First of all, uh, modeling lactation curves. There's many different methods we can use. Currently, you know, we have test day records, which are, have been true quality control DHI records. And on average, uh, each cow has about 10 records in a year. So, you know, a herd is tested once a month, and then we use that to uh, model, lact- model lactation curves and predict 305 day uh, milk yields and so on. And so when we decided to start modeling these curves using one record per day, as opposed to one record per month, um, you know, we ran into challenges like quality control. Um, We had to think about the lactation curve completely differently. So we use machine learning methods and, uh, you know, we found that I use three different machine learning methods to model the curve. And when we calculated the sum of the deviations, so the difference between the actual milk and then the milk that we had projected using these curves, we found that the correlation among the indicators of the three models were 0.99. So that was exactly what we were looking for. So it it indicates that we're calculating the same consistency indicators, regardless of which curve we're fitting. So uh, moving on from there, then when we looked at the consistency indicators, a lower consistency indicator shows a consistent cow, whereas a higher indicator is a higher, uh, is an inconsistent cow, we'll say, because there's it's the sum of the variations. So the more variation, the higher the indicator. And once we started to look at these cows, um, well, first of all, we calculated the heritabilities, as I mentioned, to be 0.23. So 23% of the resilience indicator is heritable. So uh, the phenotypic variance, uh, 23% is due to the additive component. Now, when we started to think about uh, the resilience and the perturbations, and we thought about the pen information that we have, which is very unique uh, of the US, the larger herds and cows are grouped based on different characteristics. We actually were able to look at the average number of pen movements in a lactation. And our hypothesis was that This cow, we had two cows, one with a consistency indicator of two and one with a consistency indicator of five, we'll say, so double uh, the variance. Well, the cow with the indicator of two, the consistency indicator of two, only moved pens three times within a lactation. So she wasn't bouncing around between different pens 
such as the sick pen in middle lactation, if she had a, you know, a perturbation or a sickness or um, whatever caused that. Whereas the cow with the consistency indicator of five moved pens eight times throughout the lactation. So there's obviously a major uh, labor component to this um, and, not, and therefore like an, econo- an economic value to uh, not move in a cow eight times within the same. Now, this is within the same herd. Um, of course, it's just an example, but it does show that these cows uh, are moving around a lot more if they are uh, suffering from highly variable milk yield. And so that's something else we can incorporate into a prediction model moving forward. You know, the number of pen movements within a herd, of course, because that is going to depend on a herd if they have uh, different strategies for moving cows. And then lastly, we looked at genetic correlations between our three consistency indicators and uh, the uh, sire PTAs for, uh, from the April 2023 run just last week. And we found that as uh, more inconsistent cows have lower PTAs for livability, productive life, also they tend to have lower PTAs for all of the health traits. So they range from negative 0.22 to negative 0.01. And so this is uh, as we expect. So the indicators that we are calculating are in fact capturing resiliency. We We decided to start with consistency actually because it's uh, just a, a measure of the variation across the lactation curve because we haven't actually identified the perturbations yet. But we do expect that consistency is a, is a trait that's linked with resilience uh, moving forward as we start to dig deeper into uh, perturbations. So, uh, you know, that level of correlation is, is impressive. Um, so, obviously, solid uh, indicators to, to, to follow through. So, that, that's um, uh, great to hear. I guess with within that, then what can dairy producers potentially do today with some of this information in terms of having more robust data on their own farm? Any 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 suggestions there? So obviously, you know, well calibrated daily milk meters and so forth. Um, but is there is there is there a detailed message as you've gone through this to say, you know, there are herds, farms that have better quality data than others. And and for industry, okay, this is something you can easily do to, to make sure your data is the best it can be. Yeah, for sure. I think the best place to start is definitely the calibration of inline milk meters. But also because the, in, the data is quite segregated in some ways. So the inline milk meters for example, don't have the uh, calvin information, the lactation information. We just get what's happening on a daily basis in these inline milk meters. So in order for me to capture uh, and to uh, combine data sets, I need to have the ID within herd. First of all, it has to be very accurate. So that's very, very important. Uh, when we decided to start merging data based on test day records and the daily records, we do lose quite a bit of data because there's some inconsistency between the two, whether it's the within uh, herd ID or the actual official ID, we'll say. Uh, I think, and I know this is a, an issue that's been ongoing forever in terms of ID and recording ID. We do, there has been fantastic improvements in that. But I think uh, we can always improve, right? And we can always do better. So uh, recording ID is my number one message uh, in terms of how we can implement this, um, you know, speed up the implementation of this and also extract the total value from it. Those are some great points, Fiona, at the end. They're really basic things, right? That I don't think a lot of people think about. Calibrate your meters and make sure ID is correct. You know, we, we've worked with some birds in the past that um, actually change ID when, it, when an animal calves, right? So now that, that heifer um, gets a whole new ID and, and we've, in most herds or all herds, I say we, we've changed that. The my joke is, when we tried 15, did, did your parents change your name? No, <laughs> you know, she's 24, right. five. Why would you change her, her ID when she, she freshens? But yeah, that, that then becomes a super, super headache as you're trying to maybe look back and, and oh, reeking uh, 
heifer, calf heifer performance to light kind performance, then you, you can't find that animal because your ID chain is just that. So that <clears throat> some great points. Um, I think the pen change data is is really cool. And and uh, one of your you know some of your thoughts there, you already said you know cows that have less pen moves, and we we talk about this all the time. But again, so as we work with different client slates, size farms and geographies. There, there are some farms where a cow literally freshens and hen is filled and those cows stay in that pen till they dry off or, or maybe they go to one low pen, if you will, or, uh, or before dry off, but there's maybe one or, or less pen changes in their lactation and then others, as you know, are fresh pen or you know, immediately post fresh pen. Fresh pen. Maybe they go to the hospital and then a breeding uh, pregnancy. So I guess I know a bit of your bias from what you're seeing, but and there's some other research on this, but at least your your early data evaluations would support let that cow be a cow, let her be in her social network and, and don't disrupt her much, correct? Sure. Yeah. And uh actually, you know, I presented this at UW Madison last week and we have uh behavioral specialists, you know. Uh, researchers and they ask about the social aspect of this too which is totally separate to what I'm doing but also an interesting point but the one of the novelties of the pen information when we start to look at perturbations is we can look at a, a perturbation on a pen level and then look at the, how the individual cow responds to that now one of the challenges with that is the response could be that she left the pen. She went on a holiday to the hospital pen, right? So we have to account for that as well. So we've had really interesting discussions about this. Um, but ultimately, yes, uh, you would see, you know, some of the things we're seeing is late lactation, cow doesn't move. And we would expect actually that a cow would be, we looked at the heritabilities of uh, resilience indicators, consistency indicators based on lactation period. And what we found is that, as we would expect, in the first 50 days or so, the heritability is lower. Then it gets slightly higher between day 50 to 200. And then at the end, it's the highest because we would expect the cow has very much fewer deviations or challenges once she gets to the last 100 days in milk or so. So I would expect the, the pen information would look similar where, you know, in the first 50 days, she would be she'd move around a bit between 50 to 200, um, slightly less movements. And then in the last hundred or so, even fewer movements or ideally no movements unless there is a, you know, she is sick or so, so on. So I think uh, we're going to have to write some fancy algorithms to calculate this uh, within herd, especially because, you know, we can't just look at pen movements across all herds because each herd has a different management strategy. So, um, yeah, very interesting data. Again, we haven't looked at it uh, too deeply yet, but we've been just discussing it a lot on how we can use this information and extract value from it in relation to resilience indicators. Yeah, that's certainly something that's uh, going to be uh, of great value to the to the end user producer. We think about it a lot as we do uh, pin level research trials and uh but looking at individual cow milk production, uh, you know, when a cow moves out of a pen for a hospital event, well, you know, generally if she's out of the pen more than seven days, we we don't put her back in to the trial. She may return to the pen, but she's excluded from the trial. Some of that is arbitrary, but it'd be kind of interesting to see, you know, how much time does a cow need to spend outside of the pen to disrupt her enough that then she's she wouldn't be a valid data set. No, you know, fortunately with with good health, there's not lots of cows leaving, leaving and for the hospital, but you know, with some herds that can be worse. Sure. And that's something we have to think about in terms of resilience as well. When we start to look at perturbations, do we consider a perturbation to be four consecutive days below our expectation for the milk yield? Do we consider it to be five days? Do we consider it to be six days? Because, uh, you know, we can't just consider one day below the curve to be a perturbation because that's just typical variation, we'll say, on a daily basis. But um, we've thought about this, too. And also um, there's some work out there that have used four days as a perturbation uh, in milk yield. And then another way to look at resilience is 
you can break the perturbation up into two stages. So you can look at the reaction to the uh, challenge. So that would be as the milk yield starts to drop. And then you can look at the response. So how quickly the rate that she actually uh, recovers. And it's very interesting. I like to think of, of the cows as uh, sports players. So uh, I have a friend that's a sports psychologist and I talked with him about this. And he said, you know, you can have uh, two players, one player that can score, you know, 12 goals in an easy game. But once the pressure is on, scores like two goals. Or else you can have like a consistent player that scores, um, I don't know, three goals uh, every game. And so you can predict no matter what the circumstances or what the opposition level is, how much this player is going to uh, score each time and, you know, with a high level of accuracy. So they're the type of cows I'm I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of consistency. Well, that's a great a, a example, um, Shiona. And as you know, the, the future application, I think then is that we, we obviously can't make standardized recommendations given different management schemes at hen layouts and so forth, but the hold into that a bit more is how many fen moves potentially are too much or uh, you know what actually is is detrimental. I think another aspect to that would be really interesting to investigate further also is what we see with war herds now the uh, use of sensor technology, including rumination, activity, and so forth, is that there's a health alert on a cow and trained individuals, folks that are good at detecting disease, their comment is, we can't find anything wrong with this cow. You know, she had a uh, drop in rumination, drop perhaps in production, that she was on that health index alert, but we can't find anything wrong with her. And, you know, as a veterinarian and as I work with these people, and, and examine some of these cows with them, I guess the question comes up, you know, is there is the system so accurate that there is some disease event? We just, you know, we have a stethoscope and a keto stick and a thermometer. We don't have a CT scan and you know, we're not doing a cheap blood work. Um, or is it a non-health perturbation that has nothing to do with a disease, but somehow this cow is perturbed? And had you know an infected rumination and production, but she doesn't need an antibiotic. She doesn't need an osteoidal. She just needs to recover from that. Or how do we prevent those perturbations? Right. So I think that's a cool aspect because I think we're kind of a little bit stuck into going down the line. Is we're just we're missing a health event. She's sick, but we're not finding it. She potentially isn't sick at all. Right, and. Um... In terms of the indicator that you're getting, it's based on rumination activities. Is that correct? Well, rumination, milk, um, and activity. So, you know, some, you know, those are proprietary formulas, algorithms that are used to, to alert. And then it's a number. So then herds can select, okay, we're going to look at cows. You know, we're not going to look at cows unless they're below a certain level. So there's certainly fine tuning of that system and fine tuning for each individual herd. But I guess just getting me to think that we shouldn't think that every yeah, alert, if you will, health alert, is necessarily health. It shouldn't be called necessarily health alert, right, or health indexes. It's some deviation. And it, yeah, and maybe it's not lateness or health. It's just she had a bad day. <laughs> Yeah, which happens, yeah. right? But also, I, I think uh, an important piece of that is the algorithms that are used to, you know, calculate the the um, the notifications that the producers are receiving that you guys are seeing. I think uh, that's one of the big challenges sometimes. You know, we don't actually know why we're being alerted to these um, perturbations, we'll say. But I guess if we can breed cows that are resilient moving forward, you know, that would also decrease those false alerts in a way that there's something there, but we don't actually know exactly what it is. But yeah, that's an interesting way to think about. I hadn't considered that uh, at all in terms of the end user of the output of this research as well. Excellent. Yeah, like, so it, it, it's, it's really great, Fiona, to hear the, the applicability of, of your data and what you're doing. It's a huge project. You know, we work with lots of data within our group, and, and I, I know I'm not the data f 
person, but I know that the monster that you guys are creating um, that you need to tame. So, so congratulations on that. Um, but um, thanks today for the discussion, and I guess encourage the folks to stay tuned to uh, what's coming. Um, look for Fiona's name out in different presentations and publications, meetings, and so forth. And I think, as like said, almost on every one of these podcasts, we welcome to have have you back in the future because the story isn't is uh, as it ended, right? We we still have uh, the the punchline to get to. We have some interesting information, but uh, really looking forward to what's to come. Yeah, for sure. Me too. And uh, it's been a great experience and discussion and the questions. I I really enjoy the. Um, application discussions as well you know for me that's very valuable and uh yeah looking forward to what's to come and what we can extract from from the monster right <laughs> yes it's time for our famous three ab vista helps dairy producers maximize their herd potential with feed intelligence and targeted ingredients to optimize rumen function and overall animal health from young calves to lactating dairy cows, AB Vista is here to combine industry-leading products and optimal feed strategies to increase your ROI. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and ultimately enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, Feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit, where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit diamondv.com, because animal health deserves a healthier approach. A few questions that uh, we've been asking on the podcast uh, across all the the, the hosts. Um, one is, uh, if you could uh, name a resource, it doesn't have to be a textbook necessarily, but some resource that's um, you recommend to the audience uh, for the industry for dairy. You know that's a could be the dairy podcast show, but uh, uh, a publication, a lay publication, uh, some other uh, website, what have you. Ah, huh. I always enjoy uh, reading the, and maybe I'm biased here, but the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding website. There's just so, at least for geneticists, there's so much information available uh, in terms of trait definitions, and you know this obviously flows all the way down to management as well. Um, you know, genetic evaluation, statistics over time, just seeing the direction that the industry is heading. So that's what I enjoy, uh, where I enjoy getting resources from and learning from all the time. That's great. I haven't uh, checked out that website and anything, so I'm going to. So thanks for that tip on a personal note. Uh, and then uh, while you're not working, uh, what maybe is some uh, recent read, a documentary, movie, or something to for those folks as a weekend comes to maybe disconnect from some work? Yeah, so a movie I watched recently, rewatched actually, is Moneyball, and uh, it's about how they start, and it's very relevant actually and topical because it's how they start to develop the statistics in the baseball industry. So, you know, these guys had a, a limited number of funds, and with that, um, a uh, statistician start to apply some of his uh, expertise to baseball players and that uh, they were able to put together a team based on numbers, which I see, you know, we do with cows all the time. And uh, they ended up winning, I think maybe, I don't know exactly how many they had in a row, but 15 to 20 games in a row, which was just unbelievable at the time. And then, you know, there was a lot of failure at the beginning, which is typical with um, new technology. And, you know, one of the, the lines was adapt or die. And I totally agree with that. So, uh, yeah, Moneyball movie is an enjoyable one. Yeah, that's great. I have seen that movie and I recall linking it or, or while I was watching it to, to you know, the, the dairy industry. So that, that's that's really interesting. And, and, and maybe you already just gave it uh, adapt or die with, you know, a, a word of wisdom to the, the folks listening here from Fiora in terms of <laughs> uh, dairy. Yeah, I think don't be afraid to fail, you know. Um, I think that's one of the critical aspects of learning and, uh, you know, learning how to do it wrong first, you, you know, you find all the ways that don't work. And I think that's a major part of uh, success. 
Great, great. Yeah. So for the early adopters uh, out there that are on the far right side of the curve, uh, I guess those are the folks who aren't afraid to fail, right? Or even some of right. the, uh, you know, mid, mid adopters perhaps, but that's, that's a great point. Try things, but make sure there's enough data to not really mess up, but uh, <laughs> every, everything doesn't work. Sure. Sure. It's great. Well, Fiona, it's been a pleasure uh, to visit with you today. Uh, I know our listeners will, will gain uh, a lot uh, in terms of being able to think through what you presented and then, uh, uh, you know, use some of these uh, concepts uh, right, right off and, and look forward to future data. So you have a great day. Appreciate your time.